Welcome to First English Lutheran Church of Dorset. I'm so thankful and, and joyful that you have been able to join us this morning for worship, that you're part of our family this morning watching worship. A few things about our church, just so you know. We are a confessional Lutheran church. What we believe, teach, and confess is that the Bible is the inspired and inerrant word of God, free from error, completely God's word in every sense. We also believe that we don't interpret the Bible. Scripture interprets scripture. We learn God's word, and in places, he teaches us what his word means as we follow along and stay in his word. We also believe every bit of what scripture teaches about who we are as fallen human beings. When Adam and Eve sinned and brought sin into the world, it means every person is conceived and born sinful and in need, desperate need of only what Christ did for us in his death and resurrection, his perfect life in our place. We believe in six days of creation. We believe what the Bible says. The earth was created in six normal days, not billions and millions of years ago. We don't believe in evolution because it's not what God teaches. We believe in the order of creation. We believe that Adam was created first and then Eve. We don't believe this makes men and women unequal in any way. We just believe that God has a plan, a vocation for each of us in our place, who we are as men and women. And we believe that Christ's true body and blood are present in the sacrament, not symbolically, not in some way that means his body and blood. Truly, he gives us his body and blood to eat and to drink for the forgiveness of sins and for the strengthening of our faith. We also hold to the fact that baptism means what the Lord says it is. When we're baptized into Christ, we are baptized into his death and resurrection. It truly happened. We died with Christ and we rose again with him. And each and every day that we wake to remember our baptism, we are leading the repentant life that our Lord calls us to. As Luther says in the very first of the 95 Theses, when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says repent, he wills the entire life of a Christian be one of repentance. We also believe, so importantly, that God's word actually does what it says. We're sacramental Christians. When we hear his word proclaimed, when his gospel promises are delivered, when we hear his word taught to us and explained, as you will shortly in the sermon throughout all of the liturgy, we know that the Lord is working through us, through his word, delivering his gifts, giving us what he says, forgiving us and giving us eternal life. So again, welcome to worship here at First English Lutheran Church. God bless your day in Christ. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Wonderful to start 2021. On that note, I have some very sad news to report, though. I got a call last night from Gary Stalker, Lenny's husband. They lost their son yesterday. Don't know what happened. Um, they hadn't heard from him for a while. He's had health issues off and on. They asked for a wellness check to be done. Uh, he and his wife were divorced and his little girl wasn't living there. So between grandma and grandpa, they, they wanted to check on dad. And when they had a police officer arrive to check on him, they found he had passed away. So Lenny and her husband are on their way down there now to, to spend to be with the granddaughter. and So, um, Lots of prayers are with them. It's been a very tough year. Her dad's still not. Her dad's still battling the effects of COVID and still struggling with that. So, our thoughts and prayers are bringing in husband. I had a call this morning from Gloria Beck. Jerry's in the hospital. Jerry Carlson. Um, hopefully not for very long. It sounds like it's a sodium potassium issue. Jerry's had low sodium potassium issues over the years, and sounds like that's it. So, I hope and pray that's the case, and hope he gets out soon. Um, some good news, Wayne and Ursula are in church with us. It's wonderful to see you guys. Um, got past COVID, the COVID bug, and we're very thankful. Um, our thoughts and prayers are still with Alyssa and, and her family, Zach and, and Vivian. I think they're doing fine, but they're still technically in quarantine. So um, with that, we take all of our thoughts and prayers. Hold the bullet. Thanks, Charlie. Um, I always forget the stuff, other than the prayers, I forget stuff I, I want to say. 
Um, you'll notice we don't have our inserts for this morning. That's because we get our inserts from St. John's. And occasionally St. John's follows a little different lectionary cycle than we do. They're actually commemorating or celebrating the epiphany of our Lord this morning on the second Sunday of Christmas instead of Wednesday, which is when we'll celebrate it with worship here at church. And so we got the inserts. They were the readings for epiphany. So we don't have them, but they're in your bulletin. I'll announce them as we go. And um, the psalm, too. The psalm is in your bulletin. Psalm 119, I think 97 or 105, I believe. But we'll announce them together. And I'll give you a little extra time to look in your Bible if you'd like to follow along with the readings when we get there. Okay? With that, we begin by singing our opening hymn for this morning. Hymn 384 of The Father's Love to God. Near with a true heart 
and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive the iniquity of our sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, my poor sinful being. Dear friends, upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, our psalm for this morning is Psalm 119, verses 97 through the glory of country, which we'll sing. And we'll, see, we'll speak these as we do... Uh, responsibly. I'll speak the odd stanzas and you guys can speak the odd verses and you guys will speak the even verses. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than it is, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your just decrees, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I give understanding, therefore I hate them every false way.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please be seated. Before readings from God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word for this second Sunday after Christmas, we have a reading from our Lutheran Confessions. And in this case, from the unaltered Augsburg Confession, Article 12, concerning repentance. And I'm going to read the whole thing for you. I think it's important, and, and if you read the newsletter this, this month, you're going to see an emphasis on what I talked about last week in the sermon, in the new year being Luther, resolving to be Luther, not just in name, but in practice and belief in what we do. So I'm going to read for you the whole of this article, Article 12, which in our modern ears, modern sensibilities, is going to offend some because we don't like to point out the falsehoods of others, especially in church. It doesn't seem right. We can point out falsehoods when it comes to politics and global warming and all sorts of things, but we can't point out falsehoods of truth. And here in our Lutheran Confession, we're reminded, as Lutherans, we not only confess the truth, we point out error. Okay? So this is from Article 12 of the Unaltered Augsburg Confession. Our churches teach that there is forgiveness of sins for those who have fallen after baptism whenever they are converted. The church ought to impart absolution to those who return to repentance. Now, strictly speaking, repentance consists of two parts. One part is contrition, that is terror striking the conscience through the knowledge of sin. The other part is faith which is born of the gospel, or of the absolution, and believes that for Christ's sake sins are forgiven. It comforts the conscience and delivers it from terror. Then good works are bound to follow, which are the fruit of repentance. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists, who deny that those who have once been justified can lose the Holy Spirit. They also condemn those who argue that, there, that some may teach or reach such a state of perfection in this life that they can no longer sin. The novations are also condemned, who would not absolve those who had fallen after baptism, though they return to repentance. Our churches also reject those who do not teach that forgiveness of sins comes through faith, but command us to merit grace through satisfaction of our own. They also reject those who teach that it is necessary to perform works of satisfaction commanded by church law in order to remit eternal punishment or the punishment of purgatory. A reading from our Lutheran Confessions. And now I'll give you guys time if you'd like to look in the, in the scriptures in your Hebrew Bible to find the readings. Our Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after Christmas is from 1 Kings chapter 3. Verses 4 through 15. 1 Kings 3, 4 through 15. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on, the, on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in, in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your king, your servant king, in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered and counted for multitude. 
Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this people, of this, this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life, or riches, or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Rise when you Excuse me. 
even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined through according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This too is the word of the Lord. According to St. Luke, the second chapter. Luke 2, 40 through 52, if you're looking it up. Luke 2, 40 through 52. The child Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know, it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But, they, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the Gospel of our Lord. We now confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary,
Sunday after Christmas and always, grace, peace, and mercy be yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is from our Old Testament reading. I want to go back and read most of it for you again. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during a night in a dream, and God said to him, Ask for whatever you want, and I will give it to you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you, and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him, and have given him a son to sit on his throne to this very day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. Or who is able to govern this people, this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I give you riches, I, moreover, I give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in my ways, and obey my statutes and commands as your father David did, I will give you a long life also. What a question. What a question. Imagine being asked by God to tell him what it is you want in life above everything else, and he'll give it to you. Just sit for a minute and let that sink in. Now we're in church. We know the right answer is to give outwardly. If this was a children's sermon, I called you guys up before the, the front of the altar and asked you, what would you ask most of God? You'd know the right answers, right? You'd ask for faith and strength of character, believing in Jesus for your children, all those things that are the right answer, right? But I want you to do a little introspection. I want you to think about if it was just you and God, what would you ask him for? Remember, the Lord says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And you know, what we do as fallen human beings, we justify so many of our, of our ideas and our thoughts and our wishes and our behaviors, right? When somebody else does something against us just flat out wrong, we jump all over. It's just wrong, and we know it's wrong. Why are they doing that? But when we do something similar, or something different but equally as wrong, then come the reasons why we did it. Oh, but my life was really having some problems. My marriage wasn't any good. My bank account was really suffering. This, this year's been really hard on my investments. My kids have given me nothing but trouble year after year. A myriad of excuses would come out to justify our behavior, right? So I want you to think and be honest with yourselves because you're not going to answer out loud. What is it you would ask God for above all things? Most people probably would have money pretty high on the list. You know, it might not come out that way. You might not say, God, make me rich. But it's going to come out in some way. Because after all, we live in a fallen world. We need money. We need finances. We need we need the ability to pay for things. I can't tell you how many wealthy people I've talked to that are stressed about money. <laughs> it's amazing. They're just as stressed about money as someone who has no money. And let's be honest, as Christians too, we, we all think about these things. We look forward to having that retirement home. We look forward to having that nicer vehicle, that upgrade, you know, that, that nicer one. That one people notice when we drive down the street. We look forward to having, in my case, a, a nicer fishing boat or a nicer fish house or, or whatever the case might be. 
And we justify these things, you know. I still remember a conversation with my brother years ago, and, and I love him now. I ice fished with what's called a Bexelar. Some of you people know what, know what that means. Oh, we had a, an argument. You have to have it, Chris. You have to. It's absolutely necessary. I'm like, what do you mean it's absolutely necessary? You, think of the people 30 years ago. They didn't fish with Bexelars. They didn't see the, the fish literally come off the bottom of the lake and, and rise up to meet your jig. They didn't see all that. Now I probably would agree with them. They're, they're absolutely necessary. I need one. And I tell my wife that if mine broke, right? I, honey, I need it. I have to have it. This is what we do. So what would you ask God for? If not money, maybe it would be good health, a long life, right? Boy, that's one that comes to the forefront in this crazy year of 2020 when people have been, for lots of justifiable reasons, pretty scared over what's going on, pretty concerned over what's going on. But only you know it goes back to sort of our reading from the Lutheran Confessions on repentance. Only you know when your fear has crossed the line and been a lack of faith. Right? No, I don't know that for you. You don't know when I've crossed that line. And I've been all over that line. I've been on both sides of it, back and forth. I'm not acting like up here acting like I'm some kind of self-righteous person. I go this way and this way. Some things. I do that make no sense to other people because I think it's within my sensibilities of dealing with this virus. And other things I think I don't do, people accuse me of being reckless and crazy. Why are you doing that? Okay? But long life and good health. Because again, even as Christians, we probably have these dreams in the back of our mind of growing old together with our spouse and having our retirement place at the place we want it and being comfortable enough and having good health to be able to do the things that you worked hard all your life to be able to do at that age, you know, be able to go out fishing or golfing, and enjoy time with your grandkids, all those things. Is that what's most important? Is that what you would ask if you were given the opportunity? Is that what you would ask God for if he would grant you one thing? Or would it be to take care of your kids? Make sure everything was okay with your kids and your grandkids. That's one that falls pretty near and dear to my idol worshiping heart too. Would you make sure that everything is okay with your kids? And again, we justify these things, right? There are children. There are ones that were given by God. You know, we justify when we get mad at people who do things to them and things don't work out right for them. We make excuses for them and are too hard on the other people involved and all sorts of things. And their life plan doesn't go according to our life plan for them. Again, the idol meter starts to go up, right? The idolatry meter starts to climb. But what would you ask for? I didn't touch on half the things you might ask for. Not a quarter of the things you might ask for. Just the big ones, I guess. The big ticket, big ticket ones. Money, health family welfare, things like that. What's the most important? Now, we're in church, so we know it's going to come around to a church answer. It's going to come around to a biblical answer. We're Lutherans. We're biblical Christians. That's where we go. <coughs> Solomon was asked this question. Amazing. This is one of those wonderful examples. Solomon's like Peter, like his father David, like Abraham, like any of the heroes of the faith in Scripture. Yeah, at times they show wonderful faith, but other times they fall off the cliff, right? Because they're just people, fallen human beings like you and I. But in this particular instance, Solomon was asked, and he gives a wonderful example of faith. Of course, I wonder, it'd be pretty easy when you're already the king to ask for big and noble things, wouldn't it? You know, when you're, when you're really, really, really healthy and otherwise life is going really good for you, then it's easy to ask for the noble things, right? The things that are bigger than your circumstance, because your circumstances are pretty good. They're pretty good already. But nonetheless, Solomon did ask for something that was bigger and more important than the things that maybe would have made our short list. 
when asked by God to name the one thing that he wanted, that he could have above all things, Solomon asked for biblical wisdom. That's what he asked for here. He wanted a wise and discerning heart. And remember what Proverbs 8 says about wisdom. Wisdom and fear of the Lord are connected like this. Wisdom and understanding God's will are tongue and cheek and, and hand and glove and all those things that go together perfectly. So Solomon was asking for biblical understanding God's wisdom and will for his life so that he could lead the kind of life he was supposed to and be a good and just ruler. Now, I know you guys, and I believe that what Solomon asked for would have made your list. Would it have made number one? <coughs> Interesting. I'm not sure it always would have made number one with me. I'm just being honest, because I'm just like you guys, all in person. But Solomon shows us what's truly important, and he reminds, he reminds at this point in his life, he did have great faith. He did. He remembered the Lord's promises. He asked for wisdom to be a great and discerning king to the people of Israel because he ties it back to God's promise that he made his father, the messianic promise that would come through his father David. And now Solomon, a little confused over maybe what the Messiah was all about, he points out, you kept the promise to my dad, and now you've kept it to me by placing his son on his throne. By faith, he would have understand, understood that the ultimate promise was to put the Messiah on the everlasting throne of David. But in understanding this, and through the eyes of faith, Solomon asked for that which all of us should ask for as 2020 begins. Wise and discerning hearts. Biblical wisdom to see things, to understand how the world is and who we are and what we should be thinking about things. In the world's full of examples where people simply don't do this, right? Two examples, actually more than that, but a, but a few examples that come to mind. You can be really, really smart and yet have no biblical wisdom. You could have an IQ of 170. How would they count that? I, I, how would they do that? You could have that, but have no real wisdom, common sense, biblical understanding about things because you don't have the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God in your life to enlighten you, to allow you to see things the way God would have you see them. Two examples from history of two of the smartest men that ever walked the planet, you know, in, in, a, in a short list of really smart people. The first is, um, I forget his name, the guy that discovered the law of gravity. Help me out. Newton, Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton. Brilliant. Br I mean, the law of gravity. Not, not some kind of silly theory like evolution, you know, that's some kind of hypothesis, but the law of gravity. Newton was brilliant. Newton was one of the most brilliant men living in his day. But you know what Newton also did? Newton believed every word contained in Holy Scripture. The Bible was still the single most important book to him, the book that he spent the most time with. And everything that Newton saw and understood came through the lens, the lens, the glasses, the biblical lenses of Holy Scripture and the wisdom God revealed to him through that lens. There's Newton on one side, and then there's Stephen Hawking, a more recent, equally brilliant man, theoretical astrophysicist, I think, you know, rocket scientist type person. Stephen Hawking sadly died of ALS a few years ago, and he went to his grave, as far as we know, denying God altogether. Believing in science, only science, thinking the answers were found there. Brilliant, brilliant man. But he had no wisdom. He had no understanding. He had no ability to, to know. He could probably tell you the equation, the physics equation for a wormhole, but he didn't know that God created the universe. He didn't know that he was a fallen man full of sin because of Adam and Eve, and that he needed the one and only Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, 
as he was nearing the end of his physical life in that terrible disease. I think he lived for like 60 years with ALS. That's amazing. That's amazing. But yet he died with no biblical wisdom like Solomon asked for. Comparison of two. And we're in a world full of this stuff. I just heard a news account this morning. And to not be political from the pulpit, I'll leave it up to you guys to figure what politicians decided to do this. But the House of Representatives is trying to pass rules for the start of their new legislative session, removing all gender-neutral terminology. You can't say mother or father, you have to say parent. You can't say grandmother or grandfather, you have to say parent of parent. Okay? This is the kind of stuff we're talking about that the world is so desperately lacking in. It has nothing to do with your IQ, has nothing to do with your ability to spit out a calculus equation in high school at the age of five or whatever, you know what I'm saying. It has nothing to do with any of that. It has to do with what's most important. And what's most important this Christmas season and always is recognizing who God is, who we are, and what he has done out of love for us, love that is beyond measure and understanding. <laughs> twice in the readings for today and once in the hymn and in, in, in the hymn that we just got done singing we sang about the passage that was our sermon text last week about the fullness of time again right? Hopefully you guys caught it St. Paul mentions it in Ephesians we sang about it in Stephen, in Stephen Starkey's wonderful hymn that we just sang for our, our sermon hymn the most important thing is to be able to discern that in the fullness of time God sent forth his son to be our Savior. And there's more to it than just saying, I believe in Jesus. That's the foundation. And our Lord says, faith is small as a mustard seed, right? But the bottom line is, we grow just like our Lord did. This is the amazing thing. The only account of Jesus between the age of infancy and one or two years old with the wise men and the magi and 30 or 33 years old when he started his passion is the account in Luke when Jesus, the young boy that had just become an adult, bar mitzvah age, 12, 13 years old, was allowed to go to Jerusalem with his parents to go see the temple. And Jesus, we're told, grew in wisdom. He spent his time at the temple among the religious leaders blowing their socks off. Okay? Because he was sharing with them wisdom that was his. Wisdom that from eternity, wisdom that was a part of being the pre-incarnate and now incarnate second person of the Holy Trinity that created everything. Yet Jesus still, according to his human nature, we're told, grew in wisdom and stature through the word of God. And here's something amazing too. Everybody has a problem with with not being equal in our world today, right? It's such, it's such a big buzzword. Oh, you're treating me not equal. Oh, it's unequal. It's whatever. Jesus is the Son of God. He created the world. He's the Word that was spoken by the Father that brought everything into existence. He was the angel of the Lord that appeared to Moses, the angel of the Lord that appeared to Abraham and Sarah. The whole... Um, the whole story of the Old Testament is all about Jesus. And yet, as this little boy, 12-year-old boy, he allowed his mom and dad to chastise him for not being as obedient as he should have been, for, for leaving them behind, going to the temple. He does say, Mom, Dad, didn't you know I should be about my father's business? He does say that. But then we're told after that, he went back to, to Nazareth with them and was obedient and what was the word? Subservient. Okay? Now, how's the world? Hang that on the, the nail of the world. Right? He, he is the author of everything. And yet he, for the sake of God's will, knowing God's will, being wise according to God's will, which was his own, of course, but he allowed himself to be told what to do and to be subservient to his earthly mom and dad who were both sinners. That's the kind of wisdom that Solomon is talking about. 
The kind of wisdom that doesn't come with 180 IQ, with knowing how to dissect wormholes and understand <laughs> physics. It, it, it doesn't come with any of that. It comes with being immersed in Holy Scripture. So the Holy Scriptures, the, the Holy Spirit working through the Word can enlighten you to understand things the way God would have you understand things. I repeat myself, forgive me, but I still remember a conversation I had with my dear aunt, who I love dearly, my dad's sister, very smart person, a family of smart people. Yet when it comes to the Bible and her faith, very, very liberal, very, very much lacking understanding about things, critical of those of us that rely on the Bible for everything. So she asked me one time, she said, Chris, answering everything according to what the Bible says, doesn't that make you narrow-minded? And I said, no, Aunt Sandy, it does the opposite. It does the opposite. Looking to Scripture for all of your answers opens your mind like an explosion. It broadens you. It helps you understand things the way that a world trapped in its sinfulness <laughs> Denying the Holy Spirit working through God's Word that simply can't understand. And she promised me, and I believe she will, I think she's thought of that for a number of years. Haven't talked about it with her since. But that's what King Solomon asked for. That's what he was asking God for. For wisdom that comes only through being in the Word of God. Because we're sacramental Christians. He was a sacramental Christian. Even though Christ had not been born yet, Solomon understood that God works through his word. The word isn't just a source of information and knowledge. It isn't just something that you get the right answer for. It works on you. It feeds your faith and it feeds your soul the same way that a steak dinner feeds your body. It works on you and delivers the gifts, the Holy Spirit, the wisdom and understanding that only can be given through the word of God. Solomon needed this desperately because Solomon's life didn't stay peachy keen. Guess what happened to Solomon with all those riches and all the other stuff God gave him in addition to the wisdom? Guess what at least temporarily became the most important thing in his life? All the worldly stuff. And he crashed and he crashed horribly. And we, we see this in Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes, where he talks about everything under the sun Everything that might have been on your list or the world's list of what you would ask for if God gave you a magic wish grantor and you could ask for the thing most important to you. Solomon says, he admits it in Ecclesiastes, after chasing after the wrong things, all the women and power and influence and money and all those things, setting aside the wisdom God had given him, he realized after hitting rock bottom that all that stuff was meaningless. All that stuff was nothing under the sun. Vanity of vanities, he calls it. What's the lesson for us today as we begin 2021? Be in God's word. Be in God's word always. In worship like we are today. Hearing God's word. Hearing it proclaimed, thinking about it. Be in God's word every day in daily devotions. I can't tell you. You wouldn't go for a week without eating, would you? You, you wouldn't go for a week without putting a, a spoonful or a forkful of food in your mouth. Yet not doing daily devotions is like going without eating in between worship services. Remember your baptism every morning. Baptism is your connection to repentance. The same Lutheran confessions that I read for you earlier, they tell us, Luther points out, remembering your baptism every day is beginning your day in repentance. Remembering who you are, what God has done for you. Go about your lives looking for every answer from Scripture. Don't go first to Wikipedia or Google or those other places. Go first to the Bible. What does God's word have to say and teach and enlighten you about the particular issues that are big in our day? And they will be in 2021 as well. And it all comes right down to it. I hope and pray for all of you, for myself, for my children, for my family, 
my church family, that all of us, at the top of our list, would ask for what Solomon asked for. Because in the end, only one thing, only one thing is going to ensure that everything else doesn't matter. Only one thing is going to mean eternal life and reconciliation with the Father in heaven forever. Only one thing is going to bring loved ones back together with people they've lost in tragedies like Lenny and, and Gary experienced yesterday when they heard about their son. Only one thing brings forgiveness of sins. Jesus Christ and the wisdom that points us to him that's contained in God's word. May that be your first and most important wish and prayer to God each and every day, the coming year and for your entire life here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds forever in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.
You have been chosen to fill specific duties and positions of responsibility here at First English. You are to work with the pastor that our life together in Christ may be orderly and pleasing in his sight. You are to see for the elders that the services of God's house are held at proper time, that the word of God is purely preached and taught according to the Lutheran confession, that the sacraments of Christ are administered according to his institution, and that provision is made for Christian instruction of young and old, that the errant are admonished, and that discipline in the church is maintained. For all of you as officers, you are to see that the temporal affairs of the congregation are properly administered, and that proper support is provided to workers of the congregation. You are to assist in caring for the poor and the sick, in cultivating harmony among the members, in promoting the general welfare of the congregation, and in furthering the kingdom of Christ here and throughout the world. While holiness of life and obedience to Christ are expected of all members of the congregation, it is especially important that you, as office bearers in his church, show yourselves by word and example to be faithful to him in service and Christian devotion. In the presence of God in this congregation, I therefore ask you, do you accept the offices that have been entrusted to you? Do you promise faithfully to carry out your duties, trusting the Lord, trusting in the Lord, and conforming yourself to his word in accordance with the faith of the Evangelical Lutheran Church? If so, then answer, I do. Beloved in the Lord, you have heard the promises of faithfulness spoken by these men and women whom you have elected to serve as officers of First English Lutheran Church. Do you promise to support them in their work, to remember them in, in your prayers, and to work with them to the best of the abilities that God has given you, so that he may be glorified in his work done in our midst? If so, then answer, we do. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I now install you as officers of First English Lutheran Church in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Almighty and most merciful God enlighten you and strengthen you in, his, in these offices that you may be good and faithful stewards to the glory of his holy name and to the good of his dear people. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you have raised up these servants for work among your people. We humbly implore you to grant them by your Holy Spirit those gifts needed for the faithful carrying out of their tasks, most especially wisdom, strength, and willing hearts. Let your blessing rest on this congregation, strengthen the faith, quicken the love, and enkindle the zeal of its members, that your name may be glorified, and that here and in all places under heaven, the kingdom of your Son may be advanced. We remember with thanksgiving those who have faithfully served your people and have now completed their time of service. We pray that in the end of days, we, with all your faithful people, may hear the voice of Christ saying, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, through Jesus Christ your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And now go in the name of the Lord, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that, the Lord, that in the Lord your labor is never in vain. The Almighty and merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Thanks, everybody. And thank you to those who were serving in offices and have completed your time. Now I invite you to rise to, to rise to the prayers of the church. Thank you. And now let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that your Son, the eternal Word, became flesh and has dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Extend his praise into all the world that many more along with us, would come to hope in his steadfast love. 
Lord, in your mercy. Sure. Heavenly Father, your Son diligently heard the word of God and grew in wisdom and stature, submissive to his earthly parents, and always about your business and in your house. Keep the families of your church abiding in your word, eager to be found among your word and sacraments, and always treasuring your divine wisdom and favor. <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us in Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Preserve your church by the preaching of the gospel and salvation and the zeal and the seal of the promised Holy Spirit and holy baptism. Raise up among us faithful preachers to the praise of Christ's glory until we acquire the inheritance promised for us in him. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, you gave your servant Solomon unsurpassed wisdom to rule your people Israel, chiefly the wisdom that begins in fearing you. Give to the leaders and elected officials of our nation wisdom for their tasks to discern between good and evil and to govern this people in peace and quietness. Be gracious to preserve our president and our president-elect, our governor and all legislators and judges. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, give patience and endurance to all who are sick or hurting or in any need, especially those that we mentioned before service, what they're going through, and all those we now name before you, Lord, in our hearts. Be with them and heal them according to your will. Receive our thanksgiving for every blessing and kindness you have shown your people. Give comfort and hope to all who mourn, especially as we mentioned, Lenny and Gary and their family. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our and now all these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Christmas again.
continue our lectionary study in the social hall. We'll go over the readings from today. Uh, church council meets this Tuesday, 7 o'clock. Epiphany worship is here this Wednesday on Epiphany at 6 o'clock. No Holy Communion this year, but notice the Holy Communion schedule is published in the bulletin as well. To we'll call Jeannie the sign for Holy Communion. But Epiphany worship will be this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Um, our book reading continues. Our book reading group continues. We're starting a new book this week entitled How the Choir Converted the World. Wonderful, wonderful book. Come and join us for that. Uh, Men's Club meets this Friday. I suppose breakfast at the Nevis. They're not open. Oh, breakfast here. Breakfast here. Okay. Um, Friday morning Bible study on 2 Corinthians continues this week, Friday, 1030. And I mentioned Holy Communion. I think that's everything.